So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the session on closing the finance gap for e-mobility in Sub-Saharan Africa. The session is co-hosted by Shell Foundation and Siemens Stifting, and it aims to bring together the entrepreneurs and funders, financial institutions together, and talk about the importance of supporting the e-mobility sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. The host for this, uh, the moderator for the session is uh, Miss um, Wanji Naganga, who is the regional manager for Shell Foundation in East Africa and manages the foundation's activities in the region. Uh, I would like Wanji to take over from here and share the perspective of the overall session and how we can go forward from here. Thank you, Ankit. Thank you so much uh, for the intro. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, we're really excited that you could be able to join us. Like Ankit mentioned, we're hoping to have a conversation about closing the financing gap in electric mobility um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you to the team at Sankal for helping us put together this session and hosting it. Um, today's session, we intend to hear from the entrepreneurs who work in electric mobility. From their perspective, we're going to hear from the consumers that they work with. Um, they're going to share insights from the ground and the field that they work. And also, we're going to look on the other side of the spectrum where we will speak to investors and what their experience has been in and how we can make sure we get more funding into this space. Um, I think as we start, it would be nice for us, a quick favor, if you can put in the chat box where you are dialing in from, it would be nice for us to get a sense of where in the world you're located so that we can have an idea of who, who we're speaking to and where everybody is. So just one quick minute, if you can put into the chat box, which city you're dialing in from, which country you're dialing in from, so that we can know where everybody is located. I see a lot of us are from Nairobi and um, Lagos, really good to see that. Um, folks from the UK and other parts of uh, East Africa, I see Rwanda, I see Uganda. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's it's testament to how important the work that we're speaking of is and that it's not a, it's not a one location conversation. It's a conversation that affects all of us in the globe. Um, before we dive into the session, I was just thinking about, as I was planning for this session, thinking about what we want to achieve from the conversation today. I think um, I was reflecting on electric mobility. There's a lot of conversations that have been happening recently, but uh, trying to think through why it's important. And it's important to us because it, uh, it plays a key role in helping us achieve SDG, many SDGs actually, particularly SDG 7, which is um, focused on sustainable cities. And it plays a vital role in helping us contribute towards achieving emission reduction targets. So as I'm sure many of you are well aware, Africa is experiencing the, the effects of climate change and we have to work to mitigate our global emissions and adapt changing conditions. Um, and transport is very important for us as we try to, to navigate this. Investing in electric mobility vehicles allows us to explore what is possible in our cities and to re-examine how we move around. Um, this session is going to be co-hosted by Shell Foundation and Siemens. And together with other players, we want to be advocates in the sector. We want to invest in, in entrepreneurs in the sector. We want to work with governments and many other stakeholders to ensure that we have we create a sustainable change, especially in how we think about e-mobility. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce Mara, who's from the Siemens Foundation, who's going to speak to us um, about the work that they're doing in the region. Thanks a lot, Vanji, and good morning, everyone. Ankit, could you go to the next slide? Actually, the second next. One more, please. So I quickly wanted to give you a bit of an update about why we're talking about mobility today, but as well what happened so far in the investors' um, relations, because this is not the, the first event we're having. Um, Shell Foundation and us together with UNEP and a couple of others have been starting to gather and talk more in depth about our portfolios and about the direction uh, we want to go to um, beginning of last year. So I'm not going to read all those facts to you, 
But as you can see, or most likely as well as you know, um, mobility has a crucial role in connectivity. It's an enabler um, to reach the SDGs. It has huge access on markets, on nutrition, on health, um, and on climate, as Vanji already um, stated in her short introduction. That's why we are focusing on um, mobility, more specifically on um, e-mobility today. Um, next slide, please. Um, last year, we had a couple of uh, smaller sessions because we realized to um, help the, the young market grow, we need to cooperate more as investors. And um, we did an investment survey in a couple of meetings and asked uh, funders about what are the ticket sizes, what is the funding they provide, what is the challenges, and as well, what is the plans and the pipeline pre-COVID and as well post-COVID. So on the left side, you can see um, that we did a survey in some meetings. I'm sure you find your name or maybe some um, of your organization's names there, or maybe if not, you're invited to join us for the, for the next meetings. And we see as well that um, funding provided by the investors is very um, grant heavy and uh, very small ticket sizes. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, for investment and market growth, um, there's a lot of different challenges, but we could see that investment readiness of the companies um, is a big topic, policy, so uh, market enabling is a big topic, and then due diligence pipeline. So we saw that like when we work better together as investors and we kind of coordinate a bit for the market, we can really help the market grow. So generally we can say that access to finance, access to charging infrastructure, access to information, both on the consumer as well, maybe on the regulator side um, and policy and regulatory frameworks are the main challenges that are impacting the growth of the sector in East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Um, when we look at what we can improve, it's business models for the um, social enterprises, because policy, government involvement, technology is still in a very uh, first batch production state and culture and consumer behavior and information is lacking. Um, next slide, please. Um, when we see, look at the finance and market enabling opportunities, um, we came to the conclusion that um, the investment relations that we're building and like trying to, uh, to look closer at the sector and as well to, uh, to work closer together is important because we need to, it's needed to, um, to align our financial products and to, um, to work together there. Like in the end, to enable financially, it's important to de-risk the sector, but as well, grant financing is still needed. So uh, for R&D, for first batch production, for results-based funding, that's best mostly they are done through grant funding. Um, at the moment, together, for example, with IntelliCup and a couple of other partners, we are looking as well in blended finance uh, support of the e-mobility sector so that we can really help the, um, the young sector grow. And um, while we're not talking about government involvement so much at the moment, there are a lot of activities going. Um, there's some policy drives spearheaded by GIZ and UNIP, for example. Um, there's talks to different government enablers in East Africa about investment power tariff standards. So in the charging field, um, we can have partnerships with governments in financing as well in consumer awareness and of course as a regulator. So as you can see, it like it's a holistic approach we're trying to um, to reach, and um, yeah, it's step by step. So to my last slide now, um, I quickly want to touch on what we're doing as a Siemens Foundation. So we are international nonprofit foundation, and we're focusing on social enterprises and on uh, technology. So. Um, we have an operative testing platform in Western Kenya where um, the social enterprise tests various of the solutions. We have uh, access to finance program. And I put like, I put you the visual for um, a pre-seed call that we have open at the moment. So for the, uh, for the startups and social enterprises amongst you, that might be interesting. The call is closing on 30th of April. And um, we have a lot of research publishing series um, webinars to um, teach the sector to help um, people have a voice and as well to bring new people in and to align them. Um, 
Thanks a lot. And Emma, over to you, who is presenting to you how our Shell Foundation is doing. Thanks, Mara. I think we can move to the next slide. Thanks, Anka. I'll just give a very brief overview here because many of you are familiar with our work. But just to recap that we're a UK uh, registered charity, um, independent, but linked to Shell and that Shell established 20 years ago with an endowment, the Shell Foundation, really to catalyze sustainable and sustainable uh, scalable solutions to global development challenges. And really we look to work with um, enterprises that are pioneering innovative solutions in developing markets to have an impact uh, for low income consumers. And we try to help with more than money. Um, so we have a, a very kind of collaborative approach in the way that we work with the entrepreneurs in our portfolio. Um, and really look to focus specifically on the areas of access to energy and sustainable mobility. And that experience on the energy side is, is very useful whenever we think about the charge infrastructure networks and other components that overlap uh, with the electric vehicle transition that's happening at the moment. Next slide, please. So in terms of our e-mobility focus, so we have um, supported a pipeline of, of very early stage uh, entrepreneurs across Sub-Saharan Africa and India um, that have the high potential for scale. And that's really one of our kind of uh, filters when we look for, for opportunities. And we look to support um, across a number of areas, including uh, transformative technology and business models, also supporting on the access to finance ecosystem side in which we're in discussing and, and collaborating and sharing notes with, with the Siemens Foundation. And then really looking at innovative payment solutions um, and the policy infrastructure side, uh, which we'll go into a little bit more later in, in a session with WRI. And just to mention, um, we have uh, on the line also some representatives from FCDO that we have a three year partnership with them, uh, really looking across the value chain of electric vehicle development across sub Saharan Africa with a specific focus on Ethiopia, Uganda, and Rwanda. Um, I'm very excited to, to grow that work. The next, next slide, please. This is a, a, a short summary just in terms of the, the portfolio view from Shell Foundation side. And, and the top line is, is quite key in terms of the impact that we aim to have. Um, this is really a focus on low income consumers and accelerating the transition to cleaner mobility. And you'll hear from some of the enterprises um, today that, that are within this portfolio and others within the Siemens Foundation portfolio. Um, and really what we look to understand is opportunities to help support transition and make more efficient existing mobility systems. Also look to test um, electric vehicles within existing organizations that are working on more traditional vehicle types and see how they can transition across and then work with pure electric vehicle providers um, to support really the, the actual rollout of hardware and infrastructure on the ground. And this is across uh, both rural and urban services. Um, and then we work with people like WRI um, who really support the market enabling piece of, of this puzzle in terms of connecting to government uh, policy and, and really thinking how we can grow the sector also with complementary financial intermediaries like Tugende and Jolly Finance that are, that are in the conversation today to provide asset financing for electric mobility to grow. Uh, next slide, please. And the, the final one really to mention here is that um, this is not something that can happen with any individual organization alone. This is a, a real combined effort in terms of what we think is required to, to make this transition and shift happen. And we can learn lessons from other sectors and how they've grown through time to help really overcome the barriers to scale that enterprises are, fa are facing um, to support the market to grow. And really it's looking both at the, the demand in terms of what, what is the consumer perspective on this new technology and product, how to support early stage enterprises that are making that first move, you know, and, and really taking a lot of risk on and de-risking that with grant funding. And then supporting on the institutional uh, side as well as structured finance to help uh, really move the sector forward. And this is where, you know, we're very interested to collaborate, share and, and learn with others uh, to work together on this. Um, and I think we move on. If you move on to the next slide, um, it should go back to the agenda. So from here, I'll, I'll pass back to Wanji. Um, and just to say that, um, yeah, we're really 
grateful for you know your time and for the time of all of the enterprises who've prepared for the session today and uh, really inspired by their work. So I really hope you, you enjoy this session and, and engage with it. Please uh, ask questions and put your comments in the chat box so that we can incorporate that into the session. And I'll hand to, to Wanji from here. Thanks. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you, Mara. I think um, the, mo the most important thing or the key learning is for us to understand what Siemens and Shelf Foundation and the other investors that are in this session are completely focused on and um, how we're trying to build out the electric mobility ecosystem. So we're going into the second, we're going into the part in this conversation where we're going to have entrepreneurs um, do flash pitches um, to everybody on the calls. So I would request and reiterate what Stevie spoke about, which is please put your questions in the chat box. Um, we will try to get to as many of them as we can through the session. I think there's a caveat that we need to, we need to um, highlight, which is this is not the whole ecosystem of electric vehicles in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a very small pool of what we're seeing. Um, there are many, many other companies that exist and some that we work with and some that we don't work with directly. So this is just a small taste of uh, the companies that we see in the ecosystem. Um, to the entrepreneurs who will be pitching today, just an, uh, just to note that this is going to be a three minute pitch. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to cut you off at the 30, not cut you off, but give you uh, an indicator of when we're just about to get to the end at 30 seconds to the end, so that we can make sure that we keep this session, uh, we keep the timelines that we need for this session. So maybe we can go to the next slide um, as we prepare for Max to give us a, a quick pitch on what they're doing. So Max is a social enterprise. They use mobile technology and financial inclusion to transform mobility systems and supply chains in Africa. Aditayo, who's the CEO, will be presenting to us right now. Uh, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Manji. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tayo. I'm co-founder and CEO at Max. I can uh, just want to check that everyone can hear me. All right. So at Max, you know, we're building a mobility infrastructure and services platform. Uh, we operate an integrated platform that includes a mobility marketplace that matches drivers with uh, small businesses uh, and, and commuters. Uh, we also provide driver recruitment and management services. Um, we also do vehicle design, production, and financing, and then we provide technical support and validated services to the drivers on our platform. Uh, to date, over the last three years, we've built a pipeline of about 20,000 vetted drivers, directly financed about 3,500 of them across two vehicle categories, uh, two and three wheel vehicles. We're now expanding to minibuses and four wheel vehicles as well, uh, four wheel taxis. Uh, we've designed what we call the Max M3, uh, which is uh, an electric motorcycle designed specifically for the African terrain. And we're just uh, commencing mass production to scale uh, deployment of those vehicles to about a thousand units in 2021. Uh, so far, we've uh, hit about we've deployed about 25 vehicles and four charging stations across four locations in Nigeria. Each of them does about 120 kilometers on a charge. Uh, since uh, December 2019, when we launched the first activation of our electric vehicles, uh, we've achieved close to about 4,000 battery swaps and about 100,000 kilometers covered. Um, we're looking to hit, uh, as I mentioned, about a thousand vehicles, EVs in 2021. Um, that will take require about like five billion dollars in total for us to achieve that number um, and deploy about 50 swap uh, battery swapping stations across um, uh, uh, 45 locations in in Nigeria. To date, Max in total has raised about 10 million dollars in equity funding, and through our work with um, SF, um, we've unlocked the wide the wide range of debt and supply financing programs for our drivers which now um, is approaching about $20 million, which is really exciting. We've made some amazing progress. Our work with drivers primarily is to provide them access to income generation opportunities, high quality vehicles, electric vehicles, and of course the required charging infrastructure, and also training and support services, in addition to insurance, uh, healthcare, and emergency response. Uh, we are leading the transition to sustainable and environmentally responsible mobility by deploying electric vehicles, increasing the percentage of our vehicles that are electric, gradually over the next couple of years, and of course, providing the required infrastructure to support drivers. We've also partnered with utility companies uh, and solar mini grid op uh, operators to provide power and easy access to battery swapping and charging stations as we increase our electric fleet. 
Uh, we're excited about the progress we've made so far, and um, you know we're looking to to work. We we'll continue working with SF and you know a bunch of new partners uh, to drive that transition from uh, gas-powered mobility to electric mobility. Uh, thanks, amazing. everyone. Perfect. I'm so sorry to cut you off. Um, just a kind reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them on the chat box for Max um, for us to be able to address them at the end of the session. So the way we've designed it, we're going to have pitches from four entrepreneurs and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of it and we'll be able to address your questions. So again, please go ahead and um, put your questions in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tayo. Um, I will go to our next speaker who is Tugende. Uh, Paul, the CCO is going to speak to us about what Tugende does. Um, and they provide asset financing for vehicles in Sub-Saharan Africa. They have a presence in Uganda and are growing in Kenya. And I'm looking forward to your pitch, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Um, unfortunately, there's a truck outside, so I hope that doesn't um, provide too much noise in the background. I may get an extra minute if that happens. Um, no, let, let's get straight into it. Thank you for, for the invitation. Um, a little bit about Tugende. We are a for-profit social enterprise um, that offers um, asset finance to um, aspiring entrepreneurs that um, struggle to get formal credit from the banks or the microfinance institutes. Um, we we're founded in 2012. Um, to date, we have around 43,000 clients. Uh, we've uh, dispersed assets in excess of $40 million. Um, the growth for 2021 really is all around um, continuing um, at speed local expansion in Uganda and, and Kenya, as well as embarking on a third country expansion. Um, also looking at product diversification of which um, e-mobility is now um, a firm component of, as well as um, huge investments in, in technology. Um, I'm pleased to inform the group that 2021 really is the first year where we have a green fleet target for Tugende. Um, we are already piloting electric bikes with Zembo in uh, Kampala. We are in discussions at the moment with Opibus uh, for piloting in Kenya around May or June this year with Siemens Foundation. Um, we're also in discussions with Fika Mobility in Kenya and Ampersand in Rwanda. Both of those pilots um, we're hoping should take place either this year or early next year. Um, <clears throat> obviously as an asset financier, we remain brand neutral. Um, we will offer our clients the products that um, they're looking for. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of funding for 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 e-bikes, um, we're looking for anywhere upwards of five hundred thousand dollars. We're also looking at entering um, hybrid vehicles. Um, in terms of piloting for for twenty twenty one, anywhere in the region from fifty cars um, up all the way up to two hundred or two hundred plus hybrid cars. And there we'd be looking at about four hundred thousand US dollars to about one point six million. Um, a bit of background on, on the funding side. So we were successful in closing our Series A um, despite COVID, um, which I think is 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 a bit of a um, a, a bit of a, a very proud moment for the company, so to say. Um, we're now embarking on Series B. So from the equity side, we're looking at anywhere between fifteen to twenty million dollars, and on the debt side, anywhere between twenty five million to 30 million. Um, the issue I think that Tugende faces really is um, not having enough money coming in. Um, the, the, the demands that we're seeing from the market is, I wouldn't say insatiable, but it, but it is huge. Um, we do have waiting lists. Um, you know, we are speaking with a number of different suppliers trying to maximize the supply pipeline. Um, so yeah, it, it'll be, a fantastic opportunity for us to be seen as one of the uh, one of the pioneers of uh, being able to to catalyze and enable e-mobility in uh, in East Africa across different um, green um, vehicles, be it electric bikes, hybrid vehicles, um, high, you know, electric cars, um, hybrid matatus, um, electric boats, um, so on and so forth. 
So, okay. um, Wanji, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually done. <laughs> I wanted to let you finish. So, um, your three minutes are done. I'm particularly uh, excited to hear that, uh, you know, for you to speak about your closing of the runs and what you're doing and then, you know, in the subsequent runs. But uh, unfortunately, we're out of time uh, with Tugende. Um, and therefore, would please um, ask Etain from Zembo to um, prepare himself for his speech to speak to us about what Zembo is doing. Um, they offer electric motorcycles to Buddha Buddha drivers and recharge batteries on your, in, your solar, in their solar stations. Etienne, do you mind taking us through? Um, just to make sure that I, uh, just to make sure, uh, please let me know how, no, it's fine. Okay, Etienne, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Etienne. I'm uh, the, one of the co-founders of Zembo. Thank you very much to uh, Emma for this invitation. We work with, uh, with you for a long time now. Thank you, Paul, as well, for your introduction. I'm very happy to have started this pilot with you a few uh, months ago. Um, so what do we do at Zembo? We... And obviously, thank you as well to Siemens. We also work with them uh, about off-grid station. Um, what do we do at Zembo? We have two activities. The first one is to sell electric motorcycles to uh, motorcycle taxi drivers. They are called Boda Boda in Uganda. Uh, we sell it on credit over two years. And after two years, they become owner of the bike. And that's in this framework that we work with Tugende as an asset financing company to help us on this side. The second activity of Zembo is to operate a recharge station where drivers swap their empty battery against a recharge one. Um, and they pay for a fee. Drivers don't own the battery, they pay per usage. And this is what is very important in mobility. And I will do here a parallel with the renewable energy sector where I come from. Uh, when you buy uh, solar energy, when you buy solar modules, it's very expensive at the beginning. And then at the usage, it's very cheap. In mobility, in electric mobility, that's the same. A battery is very expensive, but then to recharge it per kilometer, it's very cheap. So same as in the PEGO sector, where solar home systems are expensive to buy, but cheap to use, we need to reconcile the availability of funds on the client side, where they can pay every day, every week, but they cannot invest upfront the money to invest in a more efficient technology. For mobility, that's exactly the same. They cannot invest in the battery, which is as expensive, if not more expensive than the bike itself. Uh, it's totally impossible for drivers to invest in this battery. So we have to invent financing tools and operational models so that they don't have to invest in the battery, uh, but they pay per use. And this is what we do. Uh, we are not the only one. Uh, we appreciate a lot what, uh, what Max is doing in, uh, in Nigeria, but uh, obviously Ampersand also in Rwanda who started that uh, some years ago. Um, so this is basically what is uh, for me very important to understand in this mobility sector uh, compared to the renewable energy or the solar energy sector. Uh, that's, it's very, very good parallel to make between those both business models. Um, the second parallel I would like to do is that in terms of energy consumptions, mobility is a much bigger user than home users. If I compare yeah. solar home system, Please. sorry, I already already have my three minutes done. No, <laughs> you can take another 30 seconds so that you can wrap up the thought that you're finishing. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, if I compare the usage, the energy usage of a typical household in Africa, this is 50 to 100 times lower than a motorcycle. So having an impact on energy, on CO2, etc., is much faster per unit uh, with mobility than 
per uh, household. I don't say that doing solar home system is bad. Uh, it's really great, but in terms of energy, mobility is a very big user of energy. Um, thank you. I will not use more time. Thank you, Etienne. Um, before we go to the last uh, business, I think it's important to uh, see through all the entrepreneurs that we're speaking to, understand that they're working in different territories, different business models um, to achieve electric uh, mobility in different parts of Africa. So um, the last one in this, in this cohort is going to be Boda Work. Um, we're going to be speaking to Jacob, who is their CEO, and is going to present to us on the work that they're doing. Bodawak is an innovative battery and bike uh, producer in Uganda. Jacob, please go ahead. Hi there, everyone. Uh, Jacob here. Thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, currently the CEO at Bodawak, and we are a, a tech company, and we, we develop and produce battery technology and battery-powered applications. In Uganda for Africa, uh, we're registered since 2017. We have 35 full-time employees and on the ground local production capacity for lithium ion battery packs and different battery powered applications. Um, the angle Bodaberg is coming from is uh, we, we're seeing pretty much the same problem that everybody mentions here also in, in financing. So we have a very capex intensive uh, uh, business or, or mission. Um, so we also see the ma major thing here is cost and the way we have tried to drive down costs is uh, through a mixture of hardware development, software development and uh, business models attached to it. So we started 2017 slowly, slowly in 2018 built the first electric converted motorcycle with a few battery packs made of recycled laptop batteries and um, uh, but we really identified, you know, over the last years, we saw all the time, it's all about the battery. So our core product is uh, a modular and smart IoT battery with inbuilt financing and a democratic charging solution that doesn't require swap stations. And um, our battery now powers a range of applications that we have developed. And um, those applications um, range from electric motorcycles, two models, um, electric outboard motors, electric two walking tractors, um, electric wheelchair, a hybrid electric uh, Toyota bits. And even we also have solar charging stations and micro PV systems providing AC power as part of our um, uh, portfolio. So our battery is constantly talked to the cloud. I said it, it's IoT batteries. And we have developed, a, a, let me say, a cloud management software that allows you to manage uh, assets, users, and financing. So everything from pay as you go on mobile money up to uh, battery health and uh, uh, life extending battery updates. And so as a company, we have so far raised and invested more than a, a million USD. And uh, we are now looking uh, to raise about two and a half million USD debt or equity. And our goal now is for 2021, we're going to scale up our battery production to about three megawatt hours per year and uh, start rolling out our most profitable applications in, in partnerships or spin-offs. And um, we're, we're doing some capacity building here on the two acres of industrial land given in the industrial park to us by the government and um, would heavily invest into uh, HR uh, uh, especially commercialization of data. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And I hope I was able to spark some interest and I hope there will be lots of questions in the chat. Jacob, thank you. You're right on time, which is fantastic. Um, thank you to all of you for the pitches, for your, you know, quick run through about what the companies are doing. One of the questions that Mia has put in the chat box, which I think it would be important to get a sense from a lot of you is, um, and I think Paul is responding to it, but the question that she's asking is how easy or difficult it has been to move riders from fuel to EVs, um, especially because of the, the you know, behavior change that it entails. Um, I've seen some, some of the work that's happening here in Kenya, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I wanted to start with you, Tayo, um, to understand from your experience how that transition has been for you. 
um, as you're working in Nigeria? Sure, happy to dive into that. So I think, I mean, not, not I think, in our case, uh, drivers, uh, top priorities for them have been, uh, number one, vehicle quality, right? It's important that the EVs are as good, if not better, uh, in terms of ruggedity, you know, being able to handle all kinds of tearing and things like that, uh, suspension quality, et cetera. So vehicle design and vehicle quality, uh, super important for our drivers. They do not want an experience that is inferior to what they've always enjoyed with, you know, uh, traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. That's one. The second thing has been around energy access and battery range. Uh, so, you know, it's similar as well. You know, they want a similar experience to, um, to, to gas engines in terms of being able to access energy whenever they need it, but also not, have to, not having to swap batteries every, you know, 20 minutes or every one hour, right? So, so battery range has been very important for the drivers as well. There's also a, a few things around, because uh, the, the dynamics of, of, of driving or riding uh, an EV slightly different, you know, in terms of how it accelerates, uh, it doesn't make any noise. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, uh, especially in Nigeria where, you know, the culture is very noisy, you know. So for the drivers, there's been a bit of, a, you know, that cultural change as well. At some point, we actually explored um, in uh, uh, fitting the, the, the bikes with artificial, um, with speakers that make artificial noise, right? You know, uh, um, when when the, 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 the drivers are moving around. So I think a bit around the the some of the uh, uh, you know differences uh, in terms of the experience, but quality battery range, those are super important for the drivers. And of course, last but not least is cost. Uh, the drivers don't want to pay you know more than what they traditionally paid for um, for gas engines. And that's actually what makes it you know a little difficult for you know most of us on the companies here because we want to provide you know the same or even a better experience than gas engines. Uh, and right now, uh, electric vehicles are generally, especially the, the upfront capital expenditure is higher. The, the, the total you know, life cycle costs are lower over time, but the upfront capital expenditure is, is higher. And that means, you know, and the drivers, of course, are not going to be the ones to bear that. So, so the companies need a you know, ton of, uh, of cash to, to finance that initial transition. And then the payback eventually happens over the next couple of years. Thanks, Tayo. Um, I'm curious from your opinion, Etienne, um, especially because Tayo has spoken about the cost, the prohibitive cost. Um, so I want to pose the same question to you, which is how are you able to um, you know, give this as a value proposition or help the consumer see the value in electric vehicles, um, even with a slightly higher cost point? Um... Yeah, this is, uh, I don't know which model exactly is uh, using max and which, uh, what is the, the price of fuel motorcycle in Nigeria. Uh, in Uganda, we could make the price of the bike itself uh, slightly cheaper than a fuel bike. Um, how do we do that? First, um, the strategy of Zembo is not to sell bikes uh, over the long term. Uh, we are sure that in a few years from now, Bajaj, TVS, Yamaha will sell electric motorcycles in Africa and only electric motorcycles in Africa because it's already cheaper. If you go to China, they sold 39 million electric two-wheelers in 2019. Uh, the industry is already there. The mass production is already there. So it's already cheaper to produce an electric bike than a fuel bike. The difference is the battery. Uh, again, it's not possible in Africa to sell, in our understanding, to sell the bike with the battery included. This is why our company or the company operating should invest in the battery and even invest in two batteries because there is one battery charging while one battery is discharging. So um, as, um, uh, as you said, the TCO, the total cost of ownership, is really cheaper, notably because of maintenance, because maintenance is much cheaper with electric bike. This is, uh, in our surveys, the most important difference between electric and uh, fuel bikes. Um, but as it's a new technology, drivers take a risk. So we are convinced that we have to do everything possible to make the bike cheaper from day one. Because when you earn four, five, six dollars a day, you cannot afford to wait one, two years to earn more money. 
So our priority is to make drivers earn more money from day one. And in front of that, we have to find the financing solutions to make this possible. And this is obviously where we need to raise capital, both in equity and debt. I hope it answers your question. It does, it does. Um, I also wanted to move to you, Paul. Um, I know that you work, uh, with your work in asset financing, is this something that you've seen as well? Um, how prohibitive or how have you been able to manage the, the issue about cost? Uh, I know there's asset financing, but um, how, what, does, what role does cost play to the end consumer that you're working with? So cost for us is uh, is a major factor. Um, you know, even in our discussions with Zembo, um, the fact that we target the primarily the bottom of the pyramid, um, mass consumers. Um, like I said, a lot of these people are unbankable, so cost is is key. Um, the conversion to electric, um, as um, you know, Etienne and Opibus and Ampersand and everybody else that we've been in discussions with knows very well. Um, with the battery aside, you know, the product has to be um, comparable to the in, internal combustion engine um, cousin version, or maybe slightly more. Obviously, if it's slightly cheaper, even, even better. Um, but I think, you know, as I mentioned in the chat, one of the pushbacks that we're getting in terms of adoption is, you know, what is the resale value of the asset um, at the end of the lease period once, once, once I own the product. So <clears throat> to give an example of, of, of Uganda and Kenya, uh, if you look at the market leader, that's Bajaj, that, you know, the, the, the classic response is, um, you know, will will I get as much for my electric bike as I would had I gone for a Bajaj? So that's that's a classic argument that we're up against. Um, but yeah, I think you know what is what is the cost of entry? Um, we feel that our model provides that. Um, we have a very a small commitment fee, um, a ten percent deposit. Um, obviously, you know you need to be vetted and, and meet our criteria, but. Um, price for us is absolutely critical, just because of you know where in in the income pyramid that we're that we're operating. I think as you move up from a bike to to a three wheeler, from a three wheeler to a four wheeler, uh, to a car, etc., um, the price sensitivity goes down. Um, but you know, certainly at 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 the border level, um, you know, price is extremely sensitive. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, my last question to you. So, um, someone's asked from the from the chat box and moving a little bit past the idea or the conversation on cost about access to spare parts. So, I wonder in your work how much of an impediment this is, or if it's an impediment at all. Um, how you're going around this? Um, I actually, have two questions. That's the first one. The second one is a personal question. In your conversation today, um, you spoke about how you know, how running your business is super capex heavy um, and that you're trying as an organization to reduce your costs in hardware development and software development. So I wanted to understand how that's working for you, if you can break that down a little bit. Uh, sure, sure. Thank you very much. Um, first question, spare parts. So yes, spare parts are definitely a huge part of uh, why we do things the way we do them. So uh, as you probably know, we have a retrofitting approach for the, the, the Bajaj TVS and, and other motorcycles that are already in the market. And what you find if you look at a motorcycle, if you throw it on the side, that's a standard accident that happens, or you knock something with the front, you either break your indicators, your side mirrors, your handles, or you bend your front shocks, ETC. And we, with through our uh, retrofitting approach, we, we make sure to leverage the existing spare parts and distribution network. So you can go in the deepest north of Uganda and you get a, a pair of indicators for our <laughs> electric, you know, just converted by us, um, uh, bike, you know, in the deepest north for, I don't know, $4, a pair of indicators. So that's how we make sure we, we don't have to deal with it and we leverage what's already there, also in terms of know-how. And um, your second question went into uh, hard and software. So um, we have actually, we have 
developed our own battery electronics so and as well as our own software uh, why is that so when we analyzed coast in the beginning we found that what is most prohibitive in, in the in the current coast structure between besides the cost per kilowatt hour lithium ion cells that none of us can really implement uh, 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 you know change um what we saw is that that uh, even when we started, we, we saw, okay, capex for battery is high. We're not going to change that anytime soon. So what, what else drives cost? So we found that, you know, microfinancers offer 80 to 100% interest rate um, because they're not tech enabled. So that doubles the cost of e-mobility. Um, because everybody drives their own funny vehicle, um, we have no shared assets. So that goes in the direction of business models. Um, to enable sharing, you probably need some sort of software support. So another problem that we saw is low utilization per day. And then we have uh, almost a few players in the market who touch on the uh, circular economy bit of it. So we also have a low utilization of those assets over a lifetime. Um, so what we did is we, we developed our own electronics that is... Um, uh, namely an IoT battery management system, uh, a battery integrated charger. That's why I talked about democratic charging. So our charger allows you to charge in the city on any socket, but also allows you to charge with solar panels. So we call that, let's democratize the charging. Um, and the software is, of course, uh, the big enabler on the, on the business model innovation side. I don't know if that answered your question. It did, Jacob, it did. Um, thank you to all of you. So I want to thank you all, Jacob, Etienne, Tayo, and Paul. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I encourage anybody who wants to have continued conversations with any of these four entrepreneurs to go ahead and reach out to them directly. Um, and if you did not get their contacts, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll make that connection. I want to take us through to the next part of this conversation where my colleague, Natalie, um, I want to hand this over to you. She's going to speak about the work that WRI is doing um, and introduce us. Natalie, please go ahead. Hi everyone, this is Natalie from Shell Foundation. Um, just quickly, as Mara noted in the beginning in, in the foundation's own experience, working with private sector and mobility enterprises, um, there's a clear gap for funders and mobility enterprises in navigating policy landscape and for government to really fully leverage the positive impacts of enterprises. So um, next slide, please. Thread Mobility is a systems-based approach that leverages WRI's um, experience working with government and the foundation's experience focused on um, working with companies and um, it's, a, it's a strategic initiative for the two organizations to work on bridging the gap um, through two distinct sets of activities targeted at very specific outcomes. So one of them, one branch of it is to promote collaborative efforts between the stakeholders, as well as supportive uh, policies and regulations that involve mobility enterprises in the conversation. And on the other side, we've got... Um, our work to increase patient capital available to mobility enterprises by advocating for improved mobility's impact. So we believe that achieving these outcomes will help mobility enterprises ultimately achieve outsized impact on um, various things, including accessibility, safety, gender inclusion, and reduction in carbon emission. So the the program was launched as a strategic initiative between the two organizations, like I said, in late 2019 in two pilot cities, so Kampala, Uganda, and Hyderabad, India. And what I'm going to do now is to pass it over to Emma at WRI to walk you through uh, some of the high-level approach in Kampala. Emma, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Right. Um, Kampala is uh, home to about 4 million people, and that population is projected to grow by... Uh, 2050, it's grown to 12 million by 2050. 88% of people living in Kampala are estimated to live on under $5.5 a day. Our public transportation is characterized by informality, and this is informality in terms of regulation, management, the stops and routes for that transportation. And there's also unclear and limited policies on how new mobility enterprises can operate and really grow. 
So 3IM activities in Uganda aim to lay the foundation for policies and uh, supportive environment, operating environment for sustainable urban mobility. Can I have the next slide, please? So some of the work we've been doing uh, around this uh, in 2019, for example, uh, WRI in collaboration with the Shell Foundation and Uganda Railways Corporation and Kampala Capital City Authority organized an exhibition called Mobilize Kampala. And this brought together about 19 um, enterprises involved in the urban mobility space together with ministries and government agencies and provided an opportunity uh, for these private sector players to start to dialogue with governments on issues of immobility and sustainable urban mobility in general. WRI has also signed an MOU with Kampala Capital City Authority, KCCA. And through this MOU, we'll continue to collaborate and offer technical assistance in terms of immobility, and also to make sure that the voice of the public sector is heard in these issues. Um, we have been involved in immobility research and awareness raising, uh, such as the Future of Electric Mobility webinar that was held in May last year. This brought together a number of private sector and some government um, persons. It was really just to uh, give information about immobility in Uganda and how we can collaborate on this issue. There's also an upcoming publication that's been done in collaboration with FCDO's Cities and Infrastructure for Growth Program in Uganda and the Shell Foundation. And it's really looking at the ecosystem of e-mobility in Uganda. An excerpt of this particular uh, publication will also feature in Kampala's, uh, KCCA's Kampala Steward Magazine. So some of the key lessons that we've had from uh, our, pre our, our activities is the fact that we know that there is abundant um, climate financing, but a number of mobility enterprises are unable to communicate their impact in this area. Another key uh, lesson we've learned is that um, 3IM, because of the trust and relationships we've built, we're quite well placed to bring together the private sector and the government on immobility and sustainable urban mobility issues. So moving forward in the next 12 to 24 months, um, next slide please. Uh, we'll be looking to focus on opportunities to bridge that gap between government and private sector and the financing. And we will leverage our reputation, uh, for example, to coordinate between government and private sector. The areas we've um, come across in our activities are to do with transit data coordination and sharing, and perhaps pilot a multimodal station uh, planning. We'll be looking to identify opportunities in the regulatory framework that are supportive of sustainable urban mobility. This can come in the form of incentives to companies. For example, um, Kira Motors was born out of um, the Presidential Initiative Fund for Science and Technology Innovation. And this was, uh, it was originally a research and design project from Makere University, but because of this fund, um, it grew into the first company to produce an electric bus in Africa. So we're looking to find such opportunities in the regulatory framework that support research and companies in this space and see how to foster them and start uh, uh, foster the dialogue with government. Um, we're also looking to continue to raise awareness amongst investors. As I said, many companies are not able to communicate or quantify their impact. So we'll be looking to help them in this area and, and have them collaborate with um, investors and so that the financing in this sector uh, can be improved. Back to you, Natalie. Yeah, so really, <clears throat> excuse me, we're looking for um, partners in across all areas, including implementation, um, funding, co-funding opportunities, and actors who are interested in pushing forward policy dialogue. So if anyone's interested, please get in touch with Emma or myself, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Emma. Um, I think we will quickly run into the second part of the session, where we will have other flash pitches from four other entrepreneurs 
Um, they'll still be different. They will have different business models, different um, areas of speciality. I hope that from this session, you'll get a 360 view, not of everything that's happening, but of a little bit of the source that's happening um, in electric mobility in the space, in the ecosystem. So to get us started, we will be led by um, Josh from Ampersand. Um, he'll speak about the work that they do and Ampersand build affordable electric vehicles and charging sy systems for motorcycle taxi drivers in East Africa, specific to Rwanda. Josh, please go ahead to start. Um, as always, I will let you know 30 seconds to the end that you need to wrap it up. Thanks, Wanji. Uh, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, so Ampersand, we were first uh, the first electric bottle butter startup in Africa. Uh, we launched in uh, May of 2019 with 20 motorbikes, and now we have 60 motorbikes in operation uh, here in Kigali. Uh, we were the first with a pay-as-you-go battery system. Uh, the result is now that we have a motorcycle that costs our, mo our customers less to acquire, it costs less to operate, and it has more power and is easier to drive. And from their point of view, it just happens to be electric. Uh, customers also want the product. We have 7,000 drivers on our waiting list uh, with a 25% conversion rate. We have, uh, from, the, from the ones that we have been able to convert, uh, to uh, get a get a bike uh, due to uh, capital needs, uh, we had the first 1,300 of those drivers are completely unsolicited as well. Our first 20 motorbikes have now covered well over 1.2 million kilometers. Uh, that's several. That's a couple of times to the moon and back. Uh, the president of Rwanda has also declared that all motorbikes in the country will become electric. Uh, so, so traction and, and I think proof of proof of concept is there uh, for uh, for e-mobility in the region uh, for, for uh, motorcycles. Um, so our focus as a business is really on being the energy solution through our fleet of smart IoT connected proprietary batteries that we built here in Kigali uh, that contain a lot of uh, proprietary tech, including a vehicle control unit that acts as the brains of the battery and connects it to the, uh, to the back end, similar to uh, what, uh, what bottle work is described. Um, we have four battery swapping stations uh, and two more in construction. We're also happy to work with others who are interested to provide motorcycles, our focus being really on the energy piece. Uh, we are actively engaging now with the region's major motorcycle manufacturers uh, from India and Japan as well. Uh, the capital need uh, for the sector is not as bad as you would think. Uh, that's really driven by the high, the rapid ROI um, because of the rapid utilization rate of the battery packs. This is a B2B market. Drivers are driving for 12 hours a day. Also, the cost of building our battery swap stations is very low. Uh, we can cover a city like Nairobi with 40 stations for under $500,000. Um, and, um, uh, and so this really drives a, a really low barrier to uh, low barrier to entry. Overall, uh, we've modeled out, for example, to cover all 5 million of these butter butters in East Africa would cost about one, would take about $1.4 million of working capital as debt and equity. Uh, and that's in the context of a, of a $14 billion a year total addressable market. So that's uh, the energy sales, motorcycle sales, uh, the financing in from companies like uh, Tukende, um, as well as the and, and uh, Jali Finance here in Rwanda. Um, uh, and but eight, the eight billion dollars of that that we're focused on is the is the energy piece. So pretty modest capital needs uh, in that context. We Thank are you. raising our Series A. We have a term sheet from a Californian yeah. VC uh, as our lead investor for our Series A. Uh, they're putting in 3.5 million and uh, we're now completing the round raising 500k uh, to looking to raise 500k from an, an investor with boots on the ground in Africa uh, and also raising debt uh, capital as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for that. Um, we'll come to questions at the end of the session. I also have questions myself. Uh, but I want to introduce Asobo. And their CEO, Lawrence, will present to you on what they're doing. Um, Asobo is the first uh, enterprise that we'll speak to today who's offering e-mobility solutions on the water. Um, their work is 
been piloting in Western Kenya, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you're going to present to us, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, so I am uh, Lawrence, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Asobo. Um, we are a startup that's building a platform for e-mobility on the water in emerging markets. Um, and thank you for giving us the time to introduce Asobo. Um, and also very good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, so the problem on the water uh, is that uh, millions of people uh, depend on expensive and unreliable dirty petrol outboard engines uh, for their main source of income. For example, on Lake Victoria alone, uh, that borders Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya, um, hundreds of thousands of boat owners, crew, and their families are directly affected. So that's where we started. Um, these people, they uh, on Lake Victoria, they waste about three hundred to four hundred dollars uh, a month on their engines, uh, fuel, maintenance, and oil, um, and they experience very inconvenient and dangerous daily runs to refill their fuel tanks. Um, in the process, each boat uh, emits the equivalent of uh, roughly two British people um, in CO2 per year and, of course, pollutes the ecosystem that the fishers depend on uh, with oil spillages, etc. So, Asobo, I think we have a much, as Asobo, we have a much better way. Um, we leverage the global electric mobility revolution by offering cheaper, hassle-free and clean propulsion that always works. Um, so our e-boarders, they are electric outboard engines powered by lithium batteries and electricity, uh, massively reduce the impact on the environment. Um, and what makes us unique is that we don't necessarily focus on the technology, uh, the technology development, uh, but provide a full service leasing model that includes the financing of the e-boarders, uh, daily recharging of the batteries, uh, the transport of the batteries to and from the beaches, all maintenance and repairs, training of the crew, uh, and the 24-7 helpline with rescue backup. So what our customers experience is um, an increase in their income. Um, on average, they save about 20% per month. Um, they run a more predictable operation and they experience more convenience, comfort, and safety on board. Uh, so we, at the moment, as a Sobo, we deliver all the customer-facing activities uh, but we outsource uh, or partner in areas like technology development, production, and electricity generation. Um, and in the long run, we aim to partner in other areas as well, like financing. So I would really like to get into uh, deeper conversations with Tugenda. Um, and Paul, I know we spoke about this, so uh, we should pick that up again. Uh, but also um, on in the area of logistics to really simplify our model further. Um, so far, we have created our model together with our customers. Uh, we raised uh, initial funding for a pilot. Um, we built an initial team and started operations in the market, uh, where we now have a handful of uh, paying customers that go out every night uh, fishing with um, the e-boarders that we provide. Um, there will be another uh, 20 e-boarders available by the end of March. Um, and for the rest of 2021, we aim to increase our presence in the market, uh, build um, more proof points around the unit economics, um, improve some aspects of the technology, um, and raise our Series A round. Um, and for the Series A round, what we aim to raise is approximately five to six million dollars uh, in a combination of equity and debt uh, from our, hopefully from our current funders um, and new like-minded investors. Um, that would really go a long way uh, to get us to operational break-even um, in early 2023. Lawrence, um, yes. Uh, 30 seconds. That's great. Uh, so with that money, what we'd like to do is uh, expand the no number of hubs that we use to serve our customers from, grow the team, uh, improve the technology, and of course, serve more customers. The big uh, goal is to have uh, 5,000 boats electrified by 2025, uh, which of course would have a, a massive um, impact in both um, the environment and uh, livelihoods of the people around the lake. Um, I think I would leave it at that. I thank you very much and I would love to uh, get you on board. So join us, Obo. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, there's a You're couple welcome. of questions for you on the chat box. We'll come to them at the end of this session. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, who is Jali Finance. We're going to be speaking to their CEO, Felix, who's going to speak to us about what Jali does, which um, they provide asset financing for electric mobility solutions, and they're based in Rwanda. Felix, please go ahead and, and take the podium. Uh, thank you so much. Th thank you so much, Wanji. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'm great to be here and um, to uh, thankful for Share Foundation and CMS and and uh, everyone who organized this and uh, happy to meet uh, uh, suppliers of e-bikes and uh, uh, Tugende who uh, thought from which uh, we, we've learned a lot uh, 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 building our model. So Jali Finance, as said, is a, a startup financial institution located in Rwanda. Uh, we are doing uh, the, uh, the list to own of motorcycles. Uh, we've been doing previously for only few well, but uh, we are now uh, switching our focus to electric bike uh, motorcycles. We started in 2017 and uh, we've we impacted quite a lot of uh, um, people being drivers and the family in the same household. Uh, <clears throat> uh, contrary to many speaker today, uh, speakers today, we, uh, we are still kind of small enterprise uh, and uh, we are still uh, raising our seeds uh, in our seed days. And um, uh, we have already uh, started working with uh, three suppliers uh, on the field, uh, in, in, uh, on, on the Rwandan market today, uh, uh, which include Ampersand, among others. So I'm glad that we started working on um, a, a small scale with uh, Ampersand already, and uh, some, some other one supplier, and uh, we we'd certainly work with uh, uh, both three, at least at a certain level. So uh, we, uh, being said that we are still on stage, uh, seed stage, uh, we are looking to close that this year, and uh, by next year we need to uh, be, to have the capacity to uh, be uh, giving out uh, two thousand uh, bikes every year, which is um, which could uh, consume uh, around uh, four million in uh, portfolio yearly. And uh, uh, once we get there, we'll be, uh, we, we'll be uh, either almost the market leader in the financing part, uh, but uh, mainly in the uh, e-bikes. Uh, and uh, we might think of uh, doing other uh, markets other than Rwanda. So, uh, and then our next product, uh, we, we are looking at uh, serving more of this very same niche of uh, motorcycle drivers where we are looking at uh, consumer loans uh, of uh, uh, electricity itself, uh, fuel and insurances. And um, yeah, I think that's all I had. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Felix. I feel horrible for cutting short your presentation, um, but thank you for presenting to us. I want to quickly go to our last uh, presenter for the day um, on the entrepreneur side. I want to welcome Oliver from Anywhere Berlin, um, the entire cargo bike developers from Berlin. Um, Oliver, please go ahead and give us a flash uh, pitch on your organization. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name's Oliver with my business partner and engineer in chief, Stefan Knorr. We began Anywhere.Berlin six years ago to develop a, a new class of logistics vehicle, an off-road electric cargo to wheeler. And we ran under the hashtag forget roads because we were really, once we started delving into this area of whether you can balance cargo off-road, we suddenly realized that we could. And uh, so, uh, so forget roads became the, the essence, the DNA of what we were doing. And so here in Berlin, we, what we're really doing is product development. But of course, once, once, once it became visible and once we started thinking about it, 
And moving, uh, we caught the attention of, in the end, the German government, and we were off to a township in South Africa, Sharpville, where, after quite a hard time, we uh, we delivered thousands of meals to self-isolating people with using the bikes. Um, then Siemens Stiftung picked us up as well. Um, so I think what I'm saying here is we're really still sort of product development and the, the essence of that <clears throat> in, the, in this sort of jigsaw of, uh, of bits of e-mobility, batteries, vehicles, two-wheelers, we really see the two-wheelers as a two-wheeler lo logistic vehicles as a uh, as a winner for for Africa because um, it means less road infrastructure and um, and the sun shines thirty percent more than it does in Europe. I mean, looking at Europe, the growth of cargo logistics, micro logistics in cities is like a stealth movement. It's just it's just advanced all over Europe and in the states. Um, it's an obvious development, and it's an obvious development for Africa as well. Um, um, so motorbikes do so much, but cargo bikes, off-road cargo bikes, off-road cargo motorbikes, which is what we're working on at the moment, do a whole lot more. Siemens has shifted us towards exploring our business case. We do micro factories, we do local assembly, we do local servicing. That's our sort of business model, as it were, for rollout. And uh, so now we're moving on to e-bikes, e-bike kits, bicycle trailers and the sort of Chinese dung beetle of the uh, electric world, the three wheeler carrying one ton. Um, so these are all, uh, these are all work in progress at the moment. And, uh, and now we're starting our, with Boreal Light, we're starting um, a production facility in Nairobi. Um, I think that's about it. There's lots more, but it goes on forever, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Olive. Oliver. Thank you very, very much. I want to jump right into the questions. Um, I can see some of the questions from the chat box have been responded to. I'll take this opportunity to ask some of the questions that I have myself. Um, allow me to start with you, Lawrence. So I'm curious to understand, you've been doing some pilots in Western Kenya. I'm curious to understand, I think that it's one thing for us to have conversations in offices, but the biggest conversation that needs to be understood is the conversation with the consumer. So I'm curious to understand from your work with the consumer, the milestones that you've accomplished so far that you can share with us from the field, uh, milestones that you've past that are encouraging to you as an entrepreneur and that indicates that there is actual need for what you're trying to solve and um, appreciation from the consumer? Yeah, um, good question. Um, okay, so I think the biggest milestone uh, for us as a team um, and also the biggest milestone in terms of how, how much work it took is uh, to get a customer to pay, <laughs> which sounds um, very basic. Um, but I think that to me definitely, of course, shows that uh, there's interest um, in a service that we offer, but also uh, it took much more time to get there. And I think we shouldn't underestimate, um, I think maybe Mara mentioned it before, um, that you know there's a lot of, customer behavior change that needs to happen. Uh, also, the customers we deal with are um, understandably uh, very cautious to shift to uh, something that is new, new technology, uh, sometimes a slightly different way of operating. And um, yeah, are understandably a little bit uh, skeptical in, in the beginning. So to, um, to achieve that point of, um, of getting the first customer, not just to go out every night, um, with an e-border and relying on the technology, um, uh, you know, in storms, uh, in bad weather for 12 hours at a time, um, coming back in the morning, that's one. But then to also say, look, this is, this is good enough for me to uh, provide so much value that I'm willing to pay, that to us was a massive milestone. And what went, so, so that's the milestone in itself, but the work that led up to it I think that is the, the, the part I want to highlight because uh, we went as a team through 
you know, a number of iterations. And I, I assume this is all very familiar for all the entrepreneurs on the call, uh, but something that really surprised me, how many iterations, how deep you need to go, how much of, uh, you know, how many questions you need to ask to get to real understanding uh, that then feeds into improving your model, refining it, you know, having better payment plans, et cetera. So that's what I meant by that single word of co-creation. You know, if you unpack it, it's a lot of work and it ultimately resulted in paying customers. Um, so that I would say I would highlight as a, the main milestone so far. Is that what you mean? Yes, yes, it absolutely is. Thank you. Um, I want to segue into my next question, which is to Josh from Ampersand. Um, I think you have enjoyed a lot of successes in the work that you're doing. Congratulations. Um, the question I had is uh, a, a little bit from Lawrence's conversation in the sense of customization of bikes. So my question to you is how long has it taken for you in the evolution of your product um, between what you thought would work for the market um, to what actually does work for the market. And the purpose of asking this question is for other entrepreneurs, or even as investors, as we're looking to work with entrepreneurs, we can have this at the back of our mind, um, what the product development journey has looked like for you. Um, so we, we launched uh, way back in 2014 uh, initially, and we started by scoping which product and which market we were going to serve to really reach this tipping point of an electric vehicle that was cost competitive with a fuel vehicle without sacrificing uh, performance or convenience. Uh, it was about 2016 that we zeroed in on uh, the, the Boda Boda motorcycle taxi market and on East Africa. And, uh, and so we, we put the first prototypes on the road in 2018. We selected five different vehicles of, in different formats, including some scooters um, and did our focus grouping and, and as well as our on-road testing. Uh, and then since then, uh, it's, I mentioned earlier, we've launched commercially in May 2019. Since May of 2019, we've gone through about three different revisions and changes on the on the battery pack. I'd say, I think we're sort of starting to reach the fl a flattening of the curve in terms of the battery tech um, that, we are, that we are developing. There will still be some shifts with economies of scale and production. So things like the, the, the method that you use to, um, you know, shifting to the way that you build cell modules and, and so on may uh, uh, can can shift as you start to reach higher volume. Um, I I think that's uh, does that answer the question? I think also I, I mean a key piece of evolution is you know we originally thought of ourselves as an electric motorcycle company, and it's within the past I'd say eighteen months that we've really come to realize that um, the biggest. Uh, the, the, the newest thing we have to offer really is on the energy side of it with the battery pack. That's where the margins are best. That's where the, the value proposition that we have to offer is highest. And, and we're happy to simplify what we do and hand that over to other companies, including uh, some of the folks on this call, as well as the, the big uh, international OEMs. You know, we do have, out of necessity, we had to develop the, um, the battery pack and, and drivetrain. Uh, and the drivetrain, we're happy to monetize and to, to help to literally get, uh, get the big OEMs or anyone else uh, up, who is willing to pay uh, up to speed. But really, um, you know, we, we have, our focus is on the energy side of the piece. On the battery side, what we, what we you know, realized pretty early on is that we couldn't just go to China and buy, uh, buy off the shelf. Um, it's not like going to Yamaha or Bajaj and buying a vehicle that actually works uh, where you just walk in and say, please give me 1,000 Bajaj box of BM150s and, and you know, it will do what it says on the tin. Uh, the, the industry in China is much, much more fragmented. They're used to building electric vehicles that um, you know, don't, as, as I think it was Etienne pointed out, don't meet the performance requirements. They have about the sophistication of, a, of an electric toothbrush uh, when it comes to comparing between a Tesla. An electric motorcycle fits somewhere in between a, a Tesla car and, a, um, and an electric toothbrush, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not as simple as, um, as simply going and, and buying, buying what you can get off the shelf. The other key thing to, 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 to know, and I think for investors to know when you're assessing, um, is, that, is the cost, uh, cost of the battery pack and its lifespan and whether it is built specifically for the market. 99% of the battery packs that are out there on the market are built to be light and they're built to be cheap. 
uh, and they're built for a consumer market where it's going to take probably a decade to reach the end of life of the battery as long as it's made well. Um, and that being made well is, by the way, not something we're seeing yet uh, from the battery configurers in China, sadly. Um, uh, we, you know, had to go out to, you know, we set out to build a battery pack and energy system overall that is cost competitive with fuel. You know, we are not in a vacuum in our market. We are competing with 5 million, uh, 5 million petrol motorcycles. The advantage is that we have a customer that doesn't have to be taught how to use our product. Um, the disadvantage is that, you know, we have, a, we have something that we have to benchmark against. So, um, for, and that, that um, plays out when it comes to say, looking at use on uh, uh, mini grids, uh, where it's not, it's not a vehicle in a vacuum. There are petrol motorbikes right there that we have to, uh, have to be able to compete with. So when it comes to the cost of electricity, for example, you know, there are, there are, there are caps on, uh, on uh, the prices that we can charge and that others suppliers can charge us. Um, uh, uh, yeah, stop there. Thank you, Josh. So we're wrapping up. Uh, we're going to close this in the next uh, few minutes. Before we close, I just wanted to have uh, very, very quick opinions from some of the investors that we have in this session. Um, I wanted to hear from you, Faith, and I'm sorry to put you uh, on blast, but to understand from EEP's uh, perspective, what the funding landscape looks like from your from your frame, um, the work that you're doing and how important or integral or how you're looking at e at e-mobility. Yeah, thanks, Manji. I'm Faith and I'm currently with uh, EP. We stand for Energy and Environment Partnerships. I'm the East Africa Portfolio Coordinator and we're a clean energy financing facility that's hosted by the Nordic Development Fund. And what we do is we provide early stage funding and uh, catalytic financing, mainly in form of debt, to scheduling companies. We are currently operating in 15 countries in Eastern and uh, Southern Africa. So in the immobility portfolio, we've been supporting Zembo for the last years and uh, good to see and hear the presentation and currently ushering in another portfolio of uh, electric companies, uh, Sobo being one of them, with C. Lawrence. And then we have Mobility for Africa that's doing e-tricycles in Tanzania and uh, Nopia that's doing electric vehicles, ride hailing in Nairobi. And so really doubling down on the space. And uh, we mainly do 200, 250 to about 500,000 euros in form of grant funding. And so our role really is coming in very early stage, supporting with the pilots, supporting with the companies really get into proof of concept. And then thereafter, really helping them with the follow-up funding and I think it's been great to have some investors like Infraco, uh, Shell Foundation, also investing in some of our portfolio companies and really having discussions about the sector where we see uh, the sector going in just areas of intervention. And opportunity for collaboration is we require about 30% co-financing for most of these companies. And so what that means is for investors who, are, who have an appetite to dip their toes into the sector, but are not ready to uh, commit or write big checks yet, it's a great opportunity to really go in with us and, and, and learn at that very early stage and also to follow and invest in uh, our companies. And also, uh, I think another discussion, and this has come up clearly from the uh, presentations from Asobo, uh, Zembo, and uh, Ampersand, there's a key need for working capital, especially to meet the costs for the batteries, which are quite high and a really key uh, element of this company is really being able to scale outside of the markets they're currently operating in. So really, um, we, we really need to see more investments happening in that particular space, and uh, especially in, in form of debt, because it's just quite expensive to have equity, uh, just financing and uh, covering those costs. And then, of course, another opportunity there uh, being what Stugend is doing and really great to see all the pilots that are happening with uh, different companies to do to cover asset financing for the vehicles. Uh, so I think it would be great to see more either financing on Stugend's and for them to be able to just uh, take on more of that role or more players in the space and just more asset financing to be able to grow the, uh, the sector. Yeah, thanks. That's it for me. Thanks, Faith. Can I ask uh, Beatrice the, a similar question? 
uh, maybe you can ex you can speak through the work that you're doing, how important mobility is um, in your work, um, and what you think the the landscape in financing looks like. Could I please ask that you keep it to one minute because we have only two left. Yeah, I see. We only have a minute. This is Beatrice from Infraco Africa. As Faith mentioned, Infraco Africa is just dipping, starting to dip its toes in the immobility sector. So uh, in our portfolio, just not to repeat what Faith said, uh, we have uh, the first immobility company that you've already invested in, that is EcoRent, that is doing the Nopuride hail, hail riding uh, company. Uh, uh, we have several others in our portfolio, in our pipeline, basically. Uh, so by the end of this year, we'll perhaps have invested in one or two other immobility uh, enterprises in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa or our geographical cover is whole of sub-Saharan Africa. So it's interesting to see Nigeria and other countries that have done quite a lot on this and great work really in the immobility sector. So uh, in terms of collaboration, as Faith said, uh, this requires blended financing. And uh, the, the, the point at which we are right now is perhaps uh, grants have played a big role, but now we are seeing more and more enterprises that need to scale up and will need equity. And that's where Infraco Africa comes in because you're an equity uh, financier. And uh, with us comes other, other uh, financing like debt and guarantees because you're part of a bigger group called Peach Group. Uh, so it would be interesting to see how this plays out, especially in the, I think the enterprises are not ready for, for debt per se, because we need to reach critical mass and proof of concept for the debt to come in. So for now, I see a lot of collaboration between grant providers and early stage, uh, like EEP and uh, early stage uh, equity uh, providers like Infraco Africa. I'll stop at that because I see it's already time. Really want you. Thanks. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, I want to invite Mara to give us closing uh, conclusions. Mara, if I can ask for a favor, if you can speak to the collaborations that you would like to see, particularly with investors in the space, um, as we wrap it up. Thanks, Wanji. Great moderation. And thanks to all the um, entrepreneurs for uh, pitching. Well, I try not to keep you long. So what I would like to see, I think um, I, I really like the question in the in the chat. So um, we know it's a CapEx intense um, business. We know we need grants. There's a lot of um, consumer behavior needed. There's data needed. So that's exactly as well the um, the areas I see collaboration in. So on research and development, on uh, due diligence, on pipeline and to um, exchange as well. So um, yeah, for the investors here that haven't really been involved so far, please get in touch either with Emma or with me. So we're trying to build the uh, relations further. And um, yeah, so really happy for the event and for the turnout. And um, yeah, hope I hope to uh, see you virtually again um, for future collaborations and maybe as well co-investment or a common project at some point. Um, Emma, over to you. Yeah, just to say thank you to everyone for joining. Um, it's been really insightful, very inspirational from the entrepreneur side. Um, and thank you to Wanji for your, your excellent moderation as well. Um, and we really look forward to, to that ongoing conversation and collaboration. We have, you know, for example, discussions um, on the side with working uh, a working group on asset financing for e-mobility. Any investors that would like to join that, do please reach out and, and continue to keep in touch. Um, and we'll just yeah, ask Wanji to close and say thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. I think uh, Stevie and Mara have spoken about it. If you want to reach out to us, the email addresses are at the bottom. Um, we look forward to having you in the next virtual conversation and hopefully in person later in the year. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.